What's up everybody, Matthew here. Thank you so much for checking into the YouTube channel. If you're new or visiting, um, I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA, one of two pastors. David is great also. We're a Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. We're Reformed. We're part of the PCA. We're Presbyterian. If you're anywhere in the area, please come check us out. All right. So today we're going to continue on my little series here called The Verse That Saved. Now this is a playlist that I started some time ago and I've kind of put it aside. I've been doing other things lately, but I want to come back to this idea of the verse that saved because I think it's a nice little way to share the testimonies of some of those faithful saints who've gone before us, whom the Lord has used to great ends for the help and benefit of many in his church. And so in this series, I've already done uh, one on Jonathan Edwards, of course. What else would you expect from me? I've done St. Augustine. I've done Luther. I've done Spurgeon. And now we're going to take we're going to take up John Bunyan today in this episode. I do hope to get to some women as well in in the future, but we'll get there when we get there. So today we're going to look at John Bunyan. Now, before we look at the verse that saved John Bunyan, a couple of little qualifiers here right from the get-go. First, I do understand, and I hope you won't quibble with me here when I say the verse that saved, because obviously it is the Holy Spirit who does the work of regenerating hearts. There's no question about that. It's the Spirit of God who does the work of saving of the soul, but he does use his word. In fact, the Lord loves to use scripture itself to awaken the conscience, to prick the heart, and to give life to his elect. And so we're going to talk about the Bible verses. Actually, there's two in this video that the Lord really used in the saving of John Bunyan. I guess I'm cheating a little bit by giving two verses in this particular episode, whereas in the others I've given the main verse that the Lord used to open that person's heart monergistically and to save them unto the glory of Christ. Okay, so with those qualifiers out of the way, let's talk a little bit about John Bunyan today. 1628 to 1688, those are the dates of his life. And he's probably best known, of course, for his work, The Pilgrim's Progress, one of the classic works of all time. In fact, I've done several little videos on this channel about Pilgrim's Progress. You might want to just search my channel for more information on that. But uh, John Bunyan was a tinker by trade. He wasn't exactly a professional theologian. In fact, he is one of those great examples in church history of a man who did not have any sort of formal education classically or theologically. It's not that he went to Oxford or Cambridge or anything like that. He didn't have that kind of a background. And I think that in itself is really encouraging to those of you who are perhaps doing ministry who don't have seminary or official college training backgrounds. Now, I do think that that's probably a better course, all things considered, but the Lord can use a person in any different kind of background, right? I think we all agree on that. So Bunyan was professionally a tinker. What is a tinker? It's a person who repairs pots and pans. And you may say to yourself, well, my goodness, that sounds like a very humble calling, to which I would say you are absolutely right. It is a very humble calling. And John Bunyan was, it never really was a, a man of any certain means. In fact, I read this recently that even at his death, John Bunyan died a pauper, which is kind of sad because he never really was able to benefit from some of his uh, great works, including Pilgrim's Progress, which was gaining steam even in his day. Now, it is one of those books that its recognition has really shot up through the roof as, as the ages have gone. But unfortunately, even being the bestseller that it has been throughout church history, Bunyan himself never was really able to be sustained by that. He died with just a few cents or dollars, the equivalent thereof, in his pocket at the end of his life. Spent most, most of it in, for the most part, poverty. So he was a very humble means, very little education. And he was part of that movement called Called the Baptistic or the Nonconformist movement, meaning that he was not particularly aligned with a presbyterial system, or of course, in those days, the most relevant of those denominational structures would be the Anglican Church, the official church of England. And that's going to cause him problems because, as you probably know a little bit about English history, there were times where it was more in favor to be nonconformist than in, in other times. In fact, during the ages of non-toleration, it was pretty dangerous to be a nonconformist Baptistic pastor. They were unfortunately on the brunt end of some of the persecution, even of other Protestants, which is a, a very sad and kind of shallow uh, epoch in church history. Now, 
there were times, of course, where it was a little bit more favorable to be an independent or nonconformist or a Presbyterian. Of course, we're thinking about the times of the Westminster Assembly, of course. But then after the restoration of the monarchy, things became a little bit more dangerous for people that were nonconformists. And John Bunyan found himself on the brunt end of that stick. And unfortunately, he had to suffer through quite a bit of persecution, even in his own time, as he was imprisoned on multiple occasions. Now, backing up again to his biography, Bunyan uh, was married twice. His first wife, we do not know her name. Unfortunately, it's been lost to history. I think that's a little bit sad. And he did uh, remarry then shortly thereafter. He had a number of children, and this made his times in prison all the more complex for him because... Believe it or not, he was in kind of this quandary and predicament wherein if he were to admit to stop preaching, and the charge against him was essentially something like preaching without an official license, if he would agree to renounce the pulpit, then they could have released him at any given time from the prison. So this was truly a test of of wills for John Bunyan. Am I called by the Lord to preach or am I called to obey the dictates of man? And thankfully, for the sake of our advantage, he chose to be obedient to the Lord, refusing to give up uh, the right to preach the gospel freely, even in times when the heavy crackdown of that state system came heavy upon him. All right. Now, he himself was the beneficiary of some pretty good ministry himself before he became a pastor. His pastor was John Gifford. If you remember in Pilgrim's Progress, there's that scene where there's a painting on a wall of a grave pastor whose words are wise and has his eyes towards the heavens, if I'm recalling the scene correctly. Um, He's probably depicting there his own pastor, John Gifford, who throughout all of his life really had a very wonderful and reverent influence for John Bunyan. Now, thankfully, the Lord gave Bunyan one of those incredible gifts of preaching the word, so much so that John Owen himself, that great independent reformed theologian, John Owen, said that he would trade all of his learning to have the preaching power of the tinker, of course, referring there to uh, to John Bunyan. Now, a, a lot of people think, again, of probably Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress, easy for me to say, as uh, his most famous work. Second to that would be Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. But don't forget, Bunyan actually wrote dozens and dozens of books. Many of those have the smell of prison on them as some of his most productive times of writing was in the prison itself. And so he even says at one point he's thankful for what prison has has done in his life. Okay, so um, as he's preaching be- between those ages of toleration, he's able to, as many nonconformists did, gather great crowds. In fact, one of the difficulties of being a nonconformist pastor during times of, uh, of uh, official persecution was that they had to meet even during the night. They would call certain meetings at certain places, so-and-so's barn at 3 a.m. in the morning, and, and Bunyan was one of those preachers. I read a line from John Piper in his really wonderful book, 21 Servants of Sovereign Joy, where Piper says that Bunyan could could get an audience over over a thousand people on a weekday with just a little bit of notice. That's how powerful John Bunyan's preaching actually was. Okay, so with that in mind, let's think a little bit about his conversion and how it is that the Lord saved him and what verses the Lord used to save John Bunyan. Okay, so well, what was he saved from? Sometimes we think of Bunyan as somebody who's so imminently pure in his lifestyle, so godly in his comportment. But he admits to a number of of great sins. First of all, a a really wretched mouth is what the Lord saved him from. Now, you may say, okay, so what's the big deal about a, a, you know, a swearing mouth or a cursing mouth like a sailor or something like that? But don't forget, Jesus tells us that what comes out of the mouth is actually seated in the heart. And so whatever spews out of the mouth, like so much vomit, is actually that vomitus that's in the heart itself, that totally depraved unconverted condition of man. And so Bunyan became to re- uh, began to recognize that. But I think probably if you read um, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, one of the things that you're really going to notice is Bunyan's struggle with blasphemous thoughts. He seems to have had a mind that was just kind of bent on blasphemy. He always had very, very wicked thoughts about some of the most sacred of things. And I don't even want to suggest any ideas to your mind. 
Uh, but you can read about this in Grace Abounding again. Bunyan was virtually tortured by some of the blasphemous thoughts, demonic thoughts that goes through his mind and, uh, and into his heart. You know, there's one scene in Pilgrim's Progress that I just have to mention here, and then I'll tell you the Bible verses, I promise. Um, remember when Pilgrim is walking through the valley of the shadow of death and he's hearing kind of these haunting cries and calls of like the tortured souls and things like that. And he's hearing blasphemous thoughts. A Christian is as he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And he, he thinks it's coming from himself. But in actuality, it's sort of like the demons behind him that are whispering these thoughts, uh, chilling thoughts. And that, of course, probably is is very autobiographic in terms of Bunyan's life. He's writing these things because these are what he experienced in his life. Probably the same thing, too, with several different scenes in Pilgrim's Progress. Remember, in a giant's castle of doubting or despair, I think that also is written from his own personal spiritual experience. A number of the characters, even the slew or the slough of despond, is something that Bunyan himself had to go through. Okay, so what were the Bible verses that the Lord uses to con- use to convert his heart? Well, the first one, excuse me as I smack my mic, the first one is going to surprise you a little bit. And uh, it is actually Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, that text in which we are warned against blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may say, okay, well, I thought it was going to be John 3, 16 or something much more positive like that. But in this, in this case, the Lord used a very serious, dire, grave warning passage to convert Bunyan's heart. When Bunyan mused on those words about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and how it is unforgivable, it sent him into a spiral, a downward spiral first, in which he was just utterly convicted that he might likely be one of those persons who had sinned in this way. And the very thought in Bunyan's mind that there could be a sin, a crime against God that is so heinous that it could be unforgivable, that really sent him down a a terrible spiral of despair. And again, we might think of the slew of despond or giants doubting castle in these particular moments here where he's looking at his life and he's like, hey, if anybody has committed the sin, it's probably a wicked minded, uh, dark hearted person like myself. But remember, for the Puritans, um, part of the understanding that one has truly experienced saving grace is to first of all find out that you've gone to the utter depths of your own uh, soul and heart and character and that there is no salvation in you that could possibly save yourself by any works or transformation of the heart that you yourself could uh, enact, okay? Salvation is not synergistically as we cooperate with the Lord and sort of invite his grace into our heart, but rather it's monergistically that the Lord reaches down and saves us by his grace alone. So Bunyan, first of all, had to go all the way down into the prison of Doubting Castle before the Lord would first save him. But then when he did, the Lord brought this verse to his mind, and it is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, where the scripture says, Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And there, that thought captured his heart. The Spirit used that to crack open his dull heart uh, like, like, like a prison. And that the glory of the thought that Jesus Christ is the unchanging one, he is perfectly glorious in all of his attributes, that his grace is never ending, that the time of mercy has not closed up, that thought, um, the Lord used it to prevail upon his heart and regenerate his heart and give him the hope that he uh, experienced and he will tell you about in grace abounding to the chief of sinners, okay? So a bit of an unusual verse there for the conversion of John Bunyan, at least I think it's a little bit interesting. Um, I'm not sure how many people in Christian history would cite Matthew 12, 32, the warning against blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the verse that the Lord used to save them, but you can count John Bunyan Bunyan among that very small number uh, in which the Lord did that very thing. All right, well, thanks for checking into this particular video on John Bunyan. I'll post some links to some books about Bunyan that you might enjoy. Thanks for checking in. Love you lots. Talk to you later.